Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Sliver's Mixtape. My name is Maya Oswaldic, and it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. The lecture is, is titled Informed Design, and it is a compilation of works by the renowned and award-winning Danish architectural office 3XN, and it's going to be presented by the senior associate Jesper Bork. So 3XN is a globally operated architectural practice uh, with their headquarters in Copenhagen and offices in Stockholm, New York, and Sydney. The, pra the practice is led by Kim uh, Herforth uh, Nielsen, who is uh, 3XN's uh, founder, senior partner, and creative director. In 2007, the firm established the research and development department called GXN, which is a branch that works on implementing new materials and technologies within the studio projects. 3XN takes an innovative approach to architecture by combining science and art with a deep understanding of people and the, and the environment. The firm embodies an agenda of humanistic values and radical sustainability. And I think today we will additionally gain some insights into the studio's uh, inform, information-based approach to design in the, knowledge, uh, yeah, in the knowledge age. So Jesper Borg himself joined uh, 3XN in 2014. And since 2019, he is the director of the headquarters in Copenhagen and is responsible not only for managing and expanding the staff of more than 100 architects and engineers, but is still con contributing his strong project development and design skills to a number of architectural endeavors. In 2014, he was among the winners of the 40 Under, under 40 Award by the European Center of Architecture, Art, Design and Urban Studies, together with the um, Chicago Antinium. Jesper studied architecture at SciArc in Los Angeles, as well as at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, and the Institute of Architecture Design at uh, Alberg University, from which he graduated in 2005. And before he joined 3XN, he gained his professional experiences by working for Kopp Himmelblau and Wolfgang Chapella Architects here in Vienna. And next to Jesper's personal ties to the Angewandte and the city of, of Vienna, I would also like to point out that Vienna's architectural landscape also includes a residential bu building by 3XN, uh, carefully situated within the historic fabric of the first district. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jesper again and hand over my screen. Thank you, Maya. Thank you very much. And so I'm just going to share my screen and I hope you see um, our offices in Copenhagen. Um, so thank you, Maya, for inviting me uh, to, to do this talk. Um, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to, to be aware of uh, how much attention and, and care goes into uh, collecting a, a mixtape, as you call this series. So um, I, I sure greatly appreciate that you found a spot for me in, in, in this series. Now, um, tonight I'm going to talk about 3XN and GXN and our approach to design. And I'm going to show a few examples of, of our work. And I'm also going to talk about the process that lies behind uh, this work. And I'm sitting here uh, in the on the you know our headquarters in Copenhagen on the picture you see uh, on the on the waterfront uh, in Copenhagen. And so I was hoping to be able to show you a short introduction to 3XN and GXN. So 3XN was founded in Aarhus by three friends uh, who shared the same surname. They called themselves Three Times Nielsen. And over the last uh, 34 years, this uh, practice has become more international and we've grown our business. So today we are uh, more than 150 employees in five offices around the world. And we're working uh, across uh, a time span of 16 hours uh, uh, difference between New York and uh, Sydney. And uh, also with more than 20 different nationalities in the office. So along the way, uh, we shortened our name to 3XN. 
And we founded our sister company GXN in 2006 and with more than 100 founded research projects, uh, it has enabled us to, to link research and practice uh, together. And it is this link that enables us to, to talk about informed design. So 3XN, uh, we have built projects, uh, projects under construction in, in most of the world, actually, uh, including uh, all over Europe and in North America, uh, Australia, and lately uh, also China. And although the core of our work is uh, architecture, uh, we do a lot of other stuff as well, um, including independent research and innovation, interior and product design, as well as wayfinding and, and graphic design. Now, as I said, 3XN was founded more than 30 years ago and halfway through we uh, created GXN Innovation as a sister company because our founder, uh, Kim Nielsen, saw the need for a more sort of profound uh, research and innovation to, to complement our architectural practice. And so today we're, we're devoting two out of our five bays here in our Copenhagen studio to research and to the generation of knowledge. And when we talk about knowledge, uh, it's important to know that we don't think of knowledge as something which is um, developed in the minds of a, of a master architect. Uh, we think of knowledge as, uh, as, as being almost like a form of energy uh, or a system of flows, something that does things and, and makes things happen. And um, we uh, value knowledge, not so much for, for what it is, but for what it can do. Um, and so in our studio, knowledge is produced by a sort of a shared intelligence. That means people that are uh, collaborating together, with people with complementary skills, uh, working together on different uh, projects and purposes. So that's also the reason why uh, we employ really uh, various experts, apart from architects and, and, and designers and engineers. We also have uh, uh, anthropologists, uh, biologists, and uh, two psychologists uh, working in the office. And they're all part of, of our different design teams in both research and, and architectural projects. <clears throat> and very importantly, we all share the same space. Um, so we we find this informal knowledge sharing a very important tool for us to generate uh, and, and sort of develop this system of, of uh, knowledge so this way of practicing architecture has had a major implication of our studio and over the years uh, we've identified these three main topics with which uh, gxn is focusing on to uh, to um, to enhance our architectural production that's circular design digital design and behavior design so our interest in, in circular design was uh, the initial reason for, for establishing uh, GXN. G stands for, for green. And uh, the interest came out of uh, thinking about how much thought and intelligence goes into designing, designing and constructing uh, buildings and how little thought goes into tearing them down. And so our circular design section looks at uh, how to recirculate resources and value in the built environment. And we have made, made a number of books on this topic. Um, these are open source uh, information that is available uh, both in, in Danish and some of them in English language. Um, and we investigate three key aspects of the circular economy that's designed for disassembly, material passports and, and new business models. Uh, and one of the, these new business models could, is the upcycling of waste. And uh, more specifically, we were looking at, uh, for this project, the upcycling of waste from the food production. Um, for instance, from tomato stems, uh, where, which is an excess uh, product uh, from, uh, from the production of tomatoes, um, but which can be turned into uh, materials, insulating floor plates, wall panels uh, for, for the building industry. So we made a number of different new materials from waste products uh, in the food, in food production. 
But beyond books and, and material innovations, um, our research has been collected in this uh, circle house, which was built last year in Copenhagen. It's a, um, it's a demonstration house that shows a range of, of the different solutions uh, that we believe can be part of a circular construction and economy in the future. Um, and so in this house, all the components uh, from, from even the structural elements to, to the furniture are recycled or upcycled uh, and, and designed to be disassembled again. So I'll show you later uh, how we use uh, these uh, tools and designs on a, on a much larger scale in some of our projects. Now digital design is another key topic of our innovation group and of course there's there is no longer such a thing as, as a digital design as opposed to, to a non-digital design. All our design production is obviously digital, but one could say that we're moving towards uh, the design of systems rather than forms. Um, an example of that is the Sydney fish market where we were designing this giant roof to shade and shelter uh, the market stalls below. And as Sydney is known to have uh, very heavy, very sudden rainfall, it was important design criteria to understand how, how rainwater flows uh, across this large collecting surface. So we used, very early in the design process, used this quick and, and lightweight surface flow model uh, to make you know, intelligence decisions about, about the shape of the roof very early in the design process. So in that way, we could adjust the surface and get real-time feedback on the performance of the roof and then modify the form uh, accordingly. So the resulting shape of the roof refers to the surrounding water, not only aesthetically, but also very, in a very practical way. Another example of our, how we use parametric design in our projects uh, is the SAP garden in the Olympic Park in Munich where we created this dynamic undulating facade uh, on a curve and which obviously created a lot of different elements, uh, but we were able here to work closely together with a manufacturer uh, in the early design stages. So our design model could be directly transferred uh, to, to fabrication. Now we incorporated inputs from the manufacturer, like for instance, sheet sizes and production constraints. And this means, for instance, that each of these fins can be made from exactly one sheet of metal and thereby designing out waste and additional treatment. Um, now, we also do um, independent research uh, in alternative um, fabrication strategies. So for instance, um, Blade Runner, the project Blade Runner is a, is a research project that we've been working on for, for the last five years. And it basically we're looking at uh, hot blade cutting in foam. Um, and because we use blades, we can create double curve form work uh, for the concrete industry to make it more cost efficient and faster to produce double curved uh, concrete forms. So this is a project that we were doing together with a, a robot company here in Denmark and, um, and they are, uh, and this is our parametric designer, Ken, who's posing there in front of the, in front of the mock-up. Uh, and this is actually, uh, uh, you know, our research project has been taken over uh, and, and developed further and, um, and executed um, also. Of course, uh, made, we make test cuts and, and mock-ups to explore this uh, material. Our proposal for the concert hall in Munich is, is a good example of how we integrate this parametric design in our own projects very, our projects very early in the, in the sketching phase. So uh, this was a competition uh, for a concert building consisting of three halls uh, and the form was generated you know, simply by um, creating a blend from simple rectangular forms uh, to this uh, lightweight uh, facade um, uh, that opens up on the ground floor. So obviously the formal inspiration came from this dynamic movements of, uh, of, uh, of the human body, but also of dresses and we looked at how they behave in motion and how you can balance this level of transparency. Um, 
in a parametric way. So we, we set up this, this basic design tool um, which allowed us to intuitively sketch um, on, on the project but, and with these um, parameters. So not super advanced, but very, but very helpful and, and, um, and easy to use uh, for, the, for the design team. So the result was a very practical, uh, but also very sophisticated facade system, which allowed, allowed us uh, to have a, a combination of uses um, behind from offices to, to big foyer spaces. And um, which also has a, sort of a tension that uh, when it comes to the ground and leads um, wayfinding into the halls. So inside the facade will be uh, visible uh, between the three halls. Um, the, the three halls are volumes cut out, carved out of uh, wood, uh, both on the inside and on the outside. So here's a look inside the concert hall. Now, another example of a independent research project uh, was uh, Free the Robots. Uh, it was a study that where we explored um, how 3D printers can be made to move autonomously uh, by creating uh, uh, hacks on existing printers. So the idea was to enable robots to extend their functionality into new environments. Um, and here it's, for instance, an asphalt repair robot working on a remote road. So I think the potential for using robots in the construction industry is, is, is quite enormous, actually. And if we used it correctly, we could help restore some of uh, the man-made damages to our planet, which are difficult or uncomfortable for, for people to, uh, to get to. So the third leg of our innovation group is, is behavioral design. And I think it was uh, Churchill who, who said, uh, first we shape our buildings and then they shape us. And um, although we may not share the same aesthetic uh, value, we do agree with Churchill on, on this point and we believe that uh, architecture shapes behavior. And obviously that goes both ways and, and GXN is then saying behavior also shapes architecture. And this is essential as, because um, we always try to, we always put people in the center of our design approach. Um, and why do we do that? Well, if you look at it uh, from a client's point of view, and uh, we like to bring this uh, to meetings with, with this slide with, with clients, because it's an often overseen fact that um, the cost of designing and, and uh, erecting a building only accounts for about 2% of the entire cost the client has to spend over, on, a, on a project over a 30 year period. And then you think that it's the, probably the maintenance, the operational cost, but actually the operational costs are only 6%, so a factor three. Um, but the cost of people, staff, users, et cetera, are, accounts for 92% of the overall expense. So over a, per, a period of 30 years, which is a, a relevant investment period, the people costs uh, of, a, of a building is close to a factor of 50 to the building costs. So how can a building shape behavior? Well, this idea started 20 years ago when we were asked to design a gymnasium, a public gymnasium in uh, Copenhagen, in Ørsted. At that time, uh, early 2000, a new education uh, reform had been issued in Denmark. Um, and it was stating that, our, that um, education should be more project-based and collaborative and less classroom-based. Um, <clears throat> so at the time, uh, the physical framework didn't, for such an educational strategy actually didn't exist. So we designed the first gymnasium without any classrooms at all. It was one big open space with different spatial qualities like niches, plateaus, pots, uh, and a big central staircase connecting it all. So it was this space for collaboration, for knowledge sharing, and for informal meetings. And although it doesn't look like it, in fact, every square meter of this building is being programmed. 
uh, and eliminating the corridors in the program allowed us to reduce the overall size of this building by 25%. And as originally designed and intended for uh, 800 students, the building now, or the gymnasium now houses uh, 1,100 students and it's the most sought after gymnasium in, in Denmark. And it offers these very different uh, group-based learning env environments, some obviously more casual than others. This is one of the more formal uh, learning environments. And you also do see um, sort of um, boundaries uh, to, to other spaces, um, but always with a transparency. So, um, 10 years after we finished this building, we revisited the crime scene, you could say, and uh, studied um, the social interaction of, the, of this building. So this post-occupancy study was, um, was part of an industry PhD that uh, we did um, here uh, at 3XN. And we studied um, a number of buildings of ours, and especially the, the, the way people used it. And this led to uh, a number of insights um, which we use in our project today. Um, one of them was about the stairs uh, and the stair in Ørsted and Gymnasium um, being used as a very important tool for communication uh, and as a space for communication, especially the landings. So the stair, um, I think you see it here, wraps around the entire building and pre creates landings on every floor. And, and these spaces uh, we found out by our observations sim simply was, was incredibly important to the students. So we collected a lot of these um, uh, ideas in a behavior design guide, which we use on our projects. It talks about uh, the organizational structure of a building, the culture, the habits, um, and, and, and for instance, things like group sizes. Uh, it also talks about what we call social synergies. So um, different interactions, um, meetings, social spaces, and collaborations uh, between people in the building. And it talks about uh, somewhat more measurable uh, elements of individual well-being um like air light uh and indoor greenery um as a as measurable criteria for um for a well-being so we use these um different uh ways of designing this this knowledge that we gain in research in our projects and one of the projects that uh, maybe is the best uh, representation of this is the international headquarter for the IOC in Lausanne, in Switzerland. Now the brief uh, for this building uh, talked a lot about um, the, the different success criteria for the, for the IOC. Now the IOC is, is talking a lot about symbolism, a lot about uh, collaboration and human excellence, uh, flexibility and and then they were talking in this particular brief a lot about respectful integration in the park uh, and the commitment to sustainability. So we took the idea of an athlete in, in motion and translated that uh, into a dynamically flowing uh, facade of, of a building. Now, this is just to show that, that although we work very digital, we always start the design process by making a lot of physical sketch models. Um, and all the design um, decisions that we make are tested in physical models. In parallel, some things like facade expressions or materiality is, is obviously better tested in, in sketch renderings like these ones. So for the IOC building, we try to express this dynamic flow of uh, an athlete in motion in the facade. Uh, the facade appears differently from every angle. And um, uh, here you see a rendering of a uh, uh, proposal. And here you see the, the built reality. So I think you can see that there's a pretty precise translation from, from design to production. Um, and obviously that doesn't come uh, easily and it doesn't come without an effort. Um, 
I think it can only be done with a dynamic and, and parametric modeling universe where we can deal with the global form and, and the detail at the same time and, and change things during the entire uh, design process. So our understanding of, of a project is, is definitely shaped in the, in the parametric model. And then we, you know, slowly start to fuse in different uh, constraints, uh, for instance, for fabrication over time. Um, but we stay within the same modeling universe. So this provides us a, a model with valuable data, which is governing everything from the shape of the building to the cost and the energy performance of, of the building. And we use these models uh, also as a, in a very early design phase um, to do simulations, to study how, for instance, in this case, the shape of the facade can influence the solar shading and thereby the energy performance of the building. And all of this um, feeds back into the design. So the parametric model is really essential for having an agile design process and to be able to react to all the impulses that are coming throughout a, a design process. And uh, we've set up um, a whole system, a data flow data system, which uh, uh, always contain the base data uh, of our uh, project or of our model. And so we can locate objects um, independently of, of the software. So we work across uh, two platforms, both in Rhino, Grasshopper, and in Revit. And uh, we, they sh the model shares the same base structure. And this is, this is very important. So we, if we turn on this database, we get another layer of, of information which we can control the project more fluently and, and move between the platforms with. Right, so this is the final result um, of an athlete in motion. Um, to the building, it's a double skin facade with a, with a vertical stepping inner facade and an inclined outer facade. Um, and then it has this uh, very elegant lines across the facade. Here you see the, the entrance, um, which is tucked in underneath in this, in this plinth. Um, so the Olympic House is located in a, in a public park at the Lake Geneva. And the park uh, is the home of the Chateau DVD, which uh, still houses uh, part of the Olympic, uh, the IOC headquarter. Uh, it's connected to our building. And to integrate the, this building in the park, we lifted the Olympic house up onto a green base. Um, and in this space, there were uh, the larger functions of the building, like meeting rooms, conference facilities, and a, and a restaurant. And the upper levels are then reserved for the, for the administrative staff. Um, we, here you see these outdoor spaces uh, intended for the staff um, on the terrace, um, sort of organized around a series of skylights uh, for the restaurant below. And here you see how the building sits on the shores of, of the Lake Geneva. Now, uh, in sports, movement leads to an optimized performance. And in the same way in architecture, the formal design of the building has a direct imp impact on the, how the building performs. So in, in this project, we could optimize the facade and and the, together with the compact building volume that resulted in a, in a building using 35% less energy than a conventional new construction. And uh, solar panels, heat pumps using water from the lake provided, uh, provides uh, renewable energy to the building. And in, the, in a, a kind of a quite radical upcycling or recycling strategy, the the project also contributes to this circular economy by reusing 93% uh, of the materials from the former administrative building on the site. And the local economy uh, around Lausanne was benefited by this building also because 80% of the construction budget 
was used with local contract contractors within a, a 50 kilometers range of the site. So these are quite uh, remarkable efforts uh, and they resulted in the in a building which got the highest uh, lead rating um, ever given actually and and the highest uh, lead score has no um, for this building now moving inside uh, we used the sort of the, the, the Olympic rings, uh, we translated this symbolic meaning of the Olympic rings, uh, connecting the continents and connecting people. Um, we thought that was a pretty strong um, image uh, and, and a strong relation actually to the idea of a uh, stair connecting people. So this is uh, the, one of the early sketch models and here you see the final result. Um, so we use the five rings as uh, in a quite direct translation and, and uh, use them to connect the five floors in the building. And you get these quite remarkable views through the, the atrium space here from above and here from below when you enter the, the ground floor. So this is, these are some images from, this is from ground floor here for where the to sort of the white area and and in this case i mean not only the stair but essentially the landings are important this is basically going back to our, our research from uh, Ørsted and gymnasium so when you when you uh, access and uh, a level uh, reach a landing you you have to walk a quarter of a, a round around to the next landing and this actually um, lets you to go Across these landing zones, uh, and these and they become these uh, very valuable informal meeting places. Um, so people actually actually meet uh, across the building. Now, another project uh, that I want to show you is our key quarter tower in Sydney. The key quarter tower is the that's our. Uh, our first project in Sydney, and it's actually the first project in Australia by a Danish architect since uh, Johan Utzon did his uh, opera house on the left uh, of this picture. And it was also our first high rise building. So we were invited for this uh, competition uh, without any high rise experience. And what we did uh, was to propose to stack a series of mid rise building on, on buildings on top of each other. To scale down the high rise and get that sense of community that and, we, and belonging that we knew from from our mid rise buildings, so the new tower sits in the second row um, from the bay uh, behind an existing smaller tower, and um, so we thought we twisted the the, the facade uh, to provide views um, towards the harbour bridge on the on the bottom and and views across the bay. Uh, where that is possible on the top uh, and over the opera house. So this results in, a, in this very expressive and dynamic tower, which is broken up into these vertically stacked villages. Now, the tower is in fact uh, a refurbishment of an existing tower uh, owned by the client AMP. And uh, this was a before and after a, a attempt of, uh, of the competition. So what we did, we scraped we scraped back the existing buildings to the core. Um, we reused the structural slabs and the walls of the, remain, of the remaining tower. And then we almost doubled the floor areas, uh, adding uh, 45,000 square meters on the north side of the building. And this radical upcycling strategy for this building allowed us to retain 65 percent of the structural columns beams and slabs and almost all of the structural walls in the in the core and we saved uh, a lot of money uh, doing that a lot of time and we also saved more than uh, seven and a half thousand metric tons of carbon dioxide in materials alone so here's an image uh, of the ongoing construction site where you can see the, um, the existing core uh, and the existing building in the back, uh, the core in, in, in these white stripes and the new construction in front. 
And the new construction you see here, um, it's basically half of the building uh, towards the north uh, with this inclined facade uh, in different direction. And in this part of the building, we, we use this to, to create atrials uh, for each of the villages. So where a traditional high rise does not provide any you know, overview between the floors, uh, we introduce these atrials on a, on a on sort of the village scale to create a sense of orientation and, and belonging in the tower. Now stacking and shifting the tower volumes also creates this series of outdoor terraces, which link then to this uh, multi-level atrium inside the building. Now, since this is a multi-tenant building and we didn't know the wishes of any future te tenants uh, while designing it, and we still don't know the, the wishes of future tenants. Uh, um, we decided together with the client to create these atrium floors as so-called soft spots in the building. So most of the atrium floors are designed so that they are possible to remove according to the wishes of the, of the tenants. So we collaborated with uh, Finnish company Pico on this to develop these steel brackets, which are cast into uh, lime mortar, um, which is then which we're able to easily remove and reconfigure the slab as as desired. So the design of the atrium floor looks like this. Um, there are no bespoke elements and no welding in these elements, they're all joined together with bolts and all the elements are dimensioned so that you can be, they can be taken down by, by the freight elevator of the building. So you, you don't stop the operation of the building to, to if you change an, an atrium floor like this. So, so here are some images of the actual construction on site, um, which takes place at the moment. And the size of this atrium can then be increased or decreased. Um, along with uh, the growth uh, uh, of a company. So the podium offers uh, uh, retails and restaurants and, uh, and a green roof uh, integrated in the city. And we worked a lot together also with the city of Sydney to create these little niches and pockets around the ground level so that the tower meets the ground and relates to a more human scale. The facade, so it's a deep relief uh, with a staggering pattern, pattern uh, which is sort of comes from the existing, uh, of the grid of the existing building. But this deep relief also creates a texture on the building uh, and, and performs in an environmental way. So we could actually see that um, we, by introducing this um, relief, we, uh, which acts as a sun protection, we could uh, reduce unwanted heat gain from, from sun uh, by almost by more than 30% compared to a flat facade. So these are some of the more recent pictures from the site. So I think it's a, it's a pretty spectacular place to work. Um, and it's going to be a pretty spectacular building. Here you see um, what we call from render to reality. I think that's quite satisfying. I don't know if I can pull it up again. Yes. Um, obviously, um, not really acknowledging all the work that goes into um, making that happen, uh, that transition from render to reality. But I hope we can soon uh, um, enjoy pictures like this of uh, Sydney. Now, Another project I want to show you is uh, in Berlin, in Germany, the Cube. Uh, it's an office building on Washington Platz, right between Berlin's main railway station and the Spade River, um, and right across the Chancellor's office on the left here. This, um, this solitary cube is measuring 42 and a half meters on each side. It was part of a master plan from back from the 90s. And it will be one of the first things that you see when you exit the main train, main train station in Berlin. So the queue from the master plan was our point of origin. And we started manipulating the facade to create these exterior terraces. There's um, one on each floor of the building. 
We lifted this external skin up to create entrances and access to the terraces. And the cavity between the double skin uh, facade obviously provides an opportunity for, for natural ventilation. So on the left, the primary facade, and on the right, the, um, the secondary uh, reflective skin of the outer facade. Now the cube is special in the way that it, um, it explores new ways uh, of uh, dealing with uh, smart building technologies. So while most modern buildings, they contain a number of different digital elements, they often operate you know, on their own. Uh, in, in their own sense. But in the cube, um, all of these different systems have been connected in a single point, which we call the cube brain. And there's actually a, a small chamber in the basement uh, of, uh, of this building, which is called the cube brain. So while all the hardware of the building is connected in the brain, the software was developed especially for the users of the cube. It runs on, on, the, uh, on the user's own devices and it communicates with uh, the building through almost 4,000 sensors that are placed um, on all the floors. So access points such as doors, lifts, uh, speed gates and so on, they all operated with um, near field communication so users can use them without uh, separate cards or keys and obviously um, things like room booking desk sharing uh, and conditioning of rooms are all controlled on the on the device of the users so that information about the usage, the operation, and the energy consumption of the building, that's all fed back into the, the brain of the building and processed um, to enable this, the, the building to learn and to provide maximum occupancy and, and maximum energy efficiency. So the building was um, opened earlier this year um, and I think it's quite extraordinary uh, how it, it stands out uh, between all of the more sort of small gridded uh, facades around. Um, this um, for the facade, the outer skin facade is a low iron glass with a, with a very special coating. It's the first time uh, ever uh, this particular glazing is used on a building. Um, it reflects this, the surroundings and, and also obviously reduces heat gain from sunlight, but allows views from the inside. But uh, actually the, the, the really remarkable thing is a reflection of the, in the surface, uh, really if it makes this uh, building act like a huge uh, kaleidoscope, um, reflecting the different light conditions during the day. So you see, uh, the, how the building transforms over a um, very short uh, period of time is quite quite um, uh, remarkable. And the change from sunset to after sunset is is uh, is unique. You see, for instance, the, the angling of the facade uh, gives you different um, uh, fragments of of the city skyline in in the upper triangles, for instance. And um, if you look at, at the building against the sky, you see, you see all the different tones of, uh, of blue and white uh, that the sky reflects. Uh, here you see the integrated terraces in the middle. There are two of them. Um, and uh, this, is, um, this is a an evening photo, a blue hour. Uh, sky that reflects in the facade. There's no additional light or anything. It's not. It's, it's simply uh, the reflection of uh, the blue sky um, that provides this uh, this image. Right. So if you're in Berlin, go. Uh, if you if we ever get to travel again, uh, take a, a trip to to Berlin and uh, go uh, as you look to the right when you exit the. Uh, the main train station. So 
um, a project I want to show you here in Copenhagen is the Blue Planet. Uh, it's an aquarium and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a couple of years old uh, now. Um, it's really a, a project about uh, redefining uh, the way aquarium uh, uh, can act as a public and cultural destination. And so the idea for this aquarium or for this building was, was the experience of going under water. And the shape from above resembles a series of waves uh, or a giant vortex. And uh, on the ground, the building flows out of these uh, reflecting pools. And uh, the, the building sort of pulls the visitors in under, under these waves. The aluminium facade reflects the colors of the of the light of the surroundings and of the water, and it gives this the building this um, ever changing uh, appearance, and which is obviously also enhanced with uh, artificial light at at night, providing these almost otherworldly images uh, more than, more looking like a spaceship than a building. The roofscape. Uh, it's a quite extraordinary landscape of these small diamond shapes, aluminium plates, which all adapts to the building form. But in fact, uh, what looks complex is, is, uh, is uh, quite, quite simple and quite pragmatic uh, in the way it's built up. Now, inside the experience of being underwater is enhanced by uh, projections on the walls and on the roof, uh, as well as underwater sounds and, and obviously also the experience of actually being underwater in these tunnels where the sharks are, are crossing on top. Another uh, project uh, with sea creatures is the fish market in Sydney, which is uh, which we just started construction on uh, last month. Now the Sydney fish market is a, a sort of a reinterpretation of the typical fish market we started out by looking at what a fish market could be in the future. And currently, you know, not, it's not part of the public um, realm actually. Um, but when visiting the, the Sydney fish market, the existing market, we realized that being in a fish market is like being in an exhibition itself. It's like more than 500 species are on display. And we thought, well, we should open this experience up to the public and integrate uh, this experience with a uh, cultural experience. Um, so we worked out the, the main attractions in Sydney, placing the, the fish market as uh, one of the main attractions. And our client, the state of New South Wales, agreed that combining this industry and leisure is actually a good thing to do. And uh, I'm just going to show you a little movie about the our inspiration for the for the design of the fish market and of the of the, especially of the roof of the fish market now this the, the roof is it's an almost archetypical part of a market it's all you need basically to show that that uh, here's a market right so we draw these elements of uh, the traditional idea of a market tent fuse them with uh, more performative criteria of so a large market like this so in fact, the combination of the solar shading and the natural ventilation allowed us to reduce the areas in the market which were air conditioned by 60%. So we're building back the existing fish market and creating a new ground level with all the infrastructure, the wholesale, the auction and the loading pay. Um, so basically, uh, this is the most accessible um, and, and, and professional uh, area of the, of the fish market. Here you see the, the auction halls. And on top of that, uh, we have the public level with uh, market stalls um, and all the restaurants uh, where, you, where you as a visitor can go and buy fish. fish. Um, this level is connected to the ground with these big staircases that also access amphitheaters, meeting places. And uh, the roof 
and uh, the, the the slabs in the building are, are basically the framework of uh, of this con construction, but all the other parts are designed for to be disassembled uh, at any point of time, uh, reacting to strategies, new strategies for for the market, or new vendors coming in, or whatever happens in the future. So this is quite uh, exciting how this model sort of um, builds up while we're working uh, in the studio and uh, the boats driving by. I hear you see a couple of views across the water uh, and how this public platform dives down and, and visit, uh, or welcomes visitors. In actually in a gesture that is not unlike the gesture of the podium of Utsun's uh, opera house. So that's the fish market uh, in Sydney. And as I said, construction started uh, a little earlier this month. And uh, we hope we can uh, we can go down and visit it uh, sometime soon again. So now I've been showing you a couple of big projects. Now I'm going to show you a very small project uh, in Namur in Belgium. Uh, we uh, have the project uh, we call Cognon, um, which we see as a way of using architecture to reconnect a historic site to the city. So the site Cognong is the, is the tip of, um, of, uh, of a confluence, a piece of land uh, between the two rivers, um, Moisel and Sambo. It's situated in Namur, uh, half an hour south of Brussels in Belgium. And on the back uh, here, uh, there's the, the Roman citadel and, and the Valonian um, parliament. So it's a quite, uh, a potent site uh, and it has been always historically and in a in an attempt to make this magnificent site accessible to everybody the city of Namur uh, decided sometimes in the 60s to to plan a major regional road uh, going through the site and creating a large parking lot here um, and obviously that did not really enhance the qualities of the site um, so um, they asked uh, also, they made a competition uh, which we participated in um, to come up with a proposal to reconnect this site with the two sides of the river, also thereby reconnecting this, the, the city of Namur. Um, and also creating a new focal point in the city here, which combines the virtues of nature and technology. So our design was informed by the idea of creating this node uh, inflected by all the different flows on the site um, and sort of um, circumfered with this uh, band, uh, landscape band, which we pulled up and down uh, up to create program uh, building and down to create access uh, to the surrounding site, surrounding city. So it's really about reconnecting a city, both physically and pragmatically, uh, and, and actually also mentally. So this band uh, that wraps around the site um, provides access to the waterfront on the left, uh, but it also wraps around the facade of the building uh, towards the confluence. And um, it's, the band is accessible all the way around. So from the roof path, you have these great views towards the Bolognian parliament, the red building in the back and the Roman citadel on the hill. Um, here you see the stairs connecting the public park level uh, above on the left and the waterfront on the right. So in order to support uh, and also to capitalize on the creativity and the desire to make things which apparently it's inherent in the Wallonian society. Uh, the city of Namur provides uh, a, a maker space uh, here in, in this building where every citizen can come and use the space to turn their own ideas into reality. 
So next to, uh, next to the makerspace, there's a digital library and on the waterfront, uh, there's a, a, a cafe and a restaurant. <clears throat> so this, um, this sort of a new type of community house um, on the waterfront of uh, Namur that is becoming uh, a makerspace uh, for, the, for the people of the city. So this is a view uh, uh, across the river of Moisel. And you see here a recent uh, photograph of the site. The project is, is well underway and uh, I hope to, to finish it uh, early next year. Now, another project I want to show you is in another project in Germany, Schicko 1 in Bielefeld. We are currently building the, an extension to the headquarter of uh, the facade manufacturer, Schicko. And this new building is basically fronting the Shiko campus and, and is directly attached to the existing administration building, uh, which is a um, typical linear building with long corridors and individual uh, offices on each side. And we wanted to create somewhat the opposite with our extension. So we organized the new building uh, around a loop uh, around the central atrium. Now, uh, as, a, as a manufacturer of building components, uh, Shiku is obviously and, and fortunately very interested in circular economy and sustainability in the, in the construction industry. And so their new headquarter will in many ways be um, a sort of a showcase of what is possible here. Um, so for the first time, we are with this building aiming to um, receive the highest certificate uh, in all three major uh, systems, so LEED, BREEAM and GTNB. Uh, that's quite a traditional work and it's, uh, I think it's going to be the first time if, if, it, if it succeeds. But equally important also, of course, we want to make a, a, a beautiful building and a, and a great place to work. So as you enter this space, uh, you, you, you experience this uh, open atrium uh, with the stairs on the, on the right connecting all the floors on the different levels. And I think this, this building is in many ways our take on a future medium scale workplace where collaboration, informal knowledge sharing, uh, all key parameters of, of creating new and innovative products. So, the atrium slabs vary in, in depth and you get these uh, pockets in the atrium uh, with informal touchdown desks um, as well as more formal workstations uh, both arranged in groups and in closed spaces for more concentrated work on the on the right here and um, and, and knowledge workers like uh, the engineers at Shiku, we believe they they, it requires a lot of different settings to work in and you can choose freely between a number of different environments uh, actually during even during the day and some meeting rooms and offices obviously have, are enclosed uh, to allow concentrated work but there's always transparency and, and possibility of light to to enter every space of the building So on the top floor, we are designing an a, a library with access to uh, a roof garden. So you can take your research with you outside. Um, in fact, on every, every second floor of this building has a, an exterior terrace. And for the facade, obviously we wanted to show, uh, and Shuko wanted to show what, what one can do with a facade system like Shuko's. So we created this uh, continuous facade system which wraps around the entire building uh, and gradually lets in sunlight at, uh, and views at strategic places um, and by directing opaque panels uh, or opaque parts of the facade towards the sun we can really greatly uh, reduce the unwanted heat gain um, from sunlight which again helps uh, reducing the need for cooling so uh, these are some of the uh, 
physical renderings of, uh, of the facade, uh, which we hope is uh, quite close to, to the final uh, product, which is currently being uh, on site in, uh, in Bielefeld. Now, another project in Germany is our uh, Olympic uh, our, uh, arena for Red Bull, uh, the SAP Garden, we call it. Um, it's a project about integrating sport in the landscape. So this new uh, arena for ice hockey and basketball, um, we took our inspiration from this um, original plan by Günther Benis for the Olympic uh, venue in, in 72, which probably is the most successful Olympic venue of all times. And the new, uh, our new arena um, uh, replaces the velodrome, which was pl uh, placed in the lower left corner of the original scheme. Um, so the program for the arena consists of, uh, of an 11,000 seat um, uh, arena for ice hockey and three training fields. And so the first uh, thing we did was placing all four ice hockey fields on the same level, eight and a half meters into the ground. And that allowed us to create this uh, artificial hill across the three training fields, leaving only the oval arena itself as an element embedded in the landscape. With free access and direct access uh, to, the, to the arena all around um, the, the, this oval. And as a gesture towards the Olympic Stadium, we pulled down the edge of the facade across the diagonal uh, and rotated the facade to create this undulating dynamic profile of the building. And the entire roof is, is uh, green, like the park, so it's basically part of the, of the park, with the exception of uh, a public roof terrace, which allows visitors uh, views over the entire Olympic Park. So this is how the the arena uh, embeds itself in the landscape. Here you see this extended artificial landscape in front of the arena uh, from the other side and the Olympic Stadium tower in the background. Now we've been working a lot with these lines of both landscape, facades and uh, roofscape to extend the idea of uh, the Olympic Park that, that there are no buildings but rather organic forms embedded in the landscape. And there's no uh, straight horizon, no horizontal to horizon. There's only flowing lines which allude to this organic landscape of the Olympic Park. Now this twisting movement of the facade also enhances this experience. But at the same time, the, the, the lamellas are uh, able to uh, unify the uh, experience of very different functions uh, behind. It works quite well for both uh, foyer spaces, restaurants, cell offices, and even secondary spaces. So it's a very, it's in a way a very practical solution. Now here's just some imagery of uh, the mock-up uh, on site. Currently uh, we are almost ready to to uh, pour the first concrete. Uh, there's a giant uh, hole in the Olympic Park at the moment, uh, which I hope we can fill up uh, quite soon. So you can approach the arena from all sides. The entrances are marked uh, and visible from afar by lifting up the facade. Obviously that assists uh, wayfinding in a situation where many people are gathered. And you can also approach the buildings on, on different levels. So to the west, there's a public sunset terrace with a large restaurant connecting uh, down to the public skating rinks below. So this restaurant will be a casual place uh, which will be part of the offerings of the Olympic Park during the daytime and which will provide fans uh, with the opportunity also to enjoy away games of their team. And in the arena there are a series of more exclusive restaurants as well. Uh, and in the interior design of these spaces, we, we try to integrate the idea of a sports venue that is fused with a club or a restaurant. So 
in fact, the experience as a visitor should be more than just about the sport. Um, it should be about bringing the, this entire um, uh, restaurant experience to a new level for sports venues. So, and that, that we try to in, reflect in the in the design of these spaces. And so you get connections like these uh, views from the arena to the to the restaurants, uh, which also plays an important role in the in the atmosphere inside the arena. Um, so the hall itself, uh, as I said, has about eleven thousand seats for ice hockey. Um, it's the home of the Red Bull ice hockey team. Red Bull is our client on this project, and they have teamed up with uh, Bayern Munich, the basketball team to provide this dual venue for ice hockey and basketball. So in a matter of a couple of hours, um, the ice hockey ring can be covered and the venue can be turned into a basketball arena. Now for this, for this project, actually, we created also working closely together with the manufacturer. Uh, we created this mechanical system which allows all the tribunes in the lower part to change their inclination all around the playing fields. So we're uh, providing optimal sidelines for both ice hockey and basketball. And this will actually be the first arena in the world with, uh, with a system like this. So we're coming towards the end. Uh, now I'm going to end with a teaser and then uh, a short uh, commercial break. Um, a teaser for our new project in Paris. Um, which we recently won. Le Mans is a high-rise building in La Défense in Paris, um, and which we're now starting to develop. And I think the interesting thing about working in La Défense is the complexity of the ground floor uh, never stops to amaze me. And uh, the, 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 these vertical building zones are, in this case, actually helped um, shape the building. So. Um, and, and, and got this, this quite dramatic and quite uh, responsive um, shape of the building. And we work with dissolving the facade, this typical glass facade of, um, of uh, the, the Parisian um, uh, suburbs, introducing winter gardens, both uh, horizontally, uh, but also vertically on all levels. And here you see this, this uh, inherent complexity of the circulation on ground level, allowing uh, approaches on, on different levels. Uh, it really meant that we could work very three-dimensional with, uh, with both the ground and the, and the foyer spaces. And so now to a commercial break, uh, I will round off by recommending our new monograph uh, where you can read much more about 3XN, about our projects and uh, certainly more, maybe more interesting about our processes uh, and approach uh, to architecture. So this is a, quite a big uh, guy, more than 600 pages, uh, should be available in the bookstores before Christmas. There's also in-depth chapters on the, on the research uh, work of GXN on uh, behavior, sustainability, and, and parametric design. So thank you very much for listening in. I hope there's still someone out there. Um, and if there's any questions, uh, let me know. Thank you, Jesper. Fantastic. Uh, I'm even more excited as I was before, before the lecture. Thank you very much.